There's a famous old joke about a balloonist who's lost and he's floating over a field and he looks down and he sees someone standing in a field below. Quickly, he leans over the side and he calls out, Excuse me, excuse me, can you tell me where I am? The man on the ground looks up and says, Yes, I can. You're in a balloon floating 15 metres above this field being blown that way. The balloonist looks back and says, You must be a software engineer. Yes, I am, says the man on the ground. How could you tell? Well, says the balloonist, everything you've told me is technically exactly correct, but completely useless to me. Oh, says the man on the ground, then you must be a business manager. Yes, I am, says the balloonist. How could you tell? Well, you don't know where you are and you don't know where you're going, but you expect me to be able to help. And now you're in exactly the same situation as you were before, except somehow it's my fault. When I teach classes on campus, sometimes I'll ask the class if any of the students have worked on real software projects with real paying customers. And usually some of the students will say that they have. And I'll ask them to describe the project and they'll describe it. And I'll ask them, so on that project, what was the thing that you found the trickiest? What was the hardest bit? Usually the student will say something like, well, I kind of found understanding a customer's business was really quite tricky actually. Or, oh, we had this customer and he kept saying that what we were developing wasn't what he needed, but we just couldn't get him to tell us what, what he did need. Or, well, we were writing the software and we were putting the features out to users, but they weren't using it the way we expected. Somehow it just didn't seem to work for them. What I've never yet seen happen is for a student to say, oh, you know what, on this project, the thing I found hardest, the thing that was really, really tricky was writing the code. I've never yet seen that happen. When we teach students to program, usually we focus on the code. It's pretty easy to focus on the code. It's quite well specified, so well specified, in fact, that a machine can execute it. And there's lots and lots of things that we can analyze about it. We can analyze the algorithms in it. How complex are they? How do they perform? Are they concurrent or not? What's the security like? What would happen if we gave this some malicious input? There's lots and lots of things that we can just analyze about that code that's in front of us. But the thing is, usually programs aren't written by just one person. Most programs are bigger than one person could write. So normally it's a team writing the program and that brings in a few more questions. How easy to understand is this code? If someone who hadn't worked with this program much before started to modify it, started to edit it, started to add features to it, how likely is it that they would break it? And worse, how likely is it that they would break it and not know that they've broken it until their bug has gone out to the customer and made them very upset and potentially cost our business a lot of money? How do we get all of these team members to work together on the code? How do we give them different things to do, but make sure that all the code that they're writing all works together? How do we bring new people onto the team? How do we schedule what they do? How do, how, how do we organize this? So there's lots and lots of human processes that suddenly come in around this program. But at this stage, we're still talking about software engineers. We're still talking about people who work on programs and largely work in relatively similar ways because at least it's about code. But if we zoom out a bit further, most programs aren't written just for the sheer beauty of writing a program. Most programs are written to solve a problem, to solve someone's problem or a company's problem or sometimes society's problem. And those problems, they're not so well defined. They're certainly not defined at the start well enough that a machine could execute it. After all, otherwise we wouldn't need a team of software developers to write something that a machine could execute. So very often we have to deal with the fact that at the start actually we don't know exactly what we're building. We don't really quite know what's needed yet. And there's also usually a business context around this software team. There's some reason why these programmers are working on this code. Maybe they're volunteering their time in an open source project. Maybe a company that employs them is paying them to work on this open source project. Or maybe it's an internal development project and they are there being paid to develop some software that's going to solve their company's business problem. 
Or maybe they work for a company that sells software to other people or charges them a service fee to use it, and so they, they're solving other people's problems. That business context can make a very big difference to how the developers have to write their program, what the processes are around it. Sometimes there's a lot of trust between the customer and the development team. Perhaps you're an internal development team building something for your own company. Or perhaps you are already recognised as being very, very good at what you do and very, very trustworthy. And in those cases, sometimes the customer will be willing to work with you in an agile process. These recognise that we don't know what we're building at the start. And so instead, they try to decide, OK, what's the most important part? Because let's build a little bit of that first and let's try it out and let's find out whether that really is the solution that we ought to be building. And if it is, we'll be able to move along on to the next most important set of features. And if it isn't, we'll be able to iterate. But in that situation, you don't know what's going to be built and you don't know how long it's going to take. Sometimes you can't do that. Sometimes you'll be doing something for a customer that's going to write a big check. And before they sign the contract, they want to know exactly what it is that you're going to be delivering and exactly when you're going to be delivering it by. And they might put in penalty clauses into the contract to say that if you are late, we will charge you a lot of money for being late. Perhaps it's the government. Perhaps they've had to get parliamentary approval for this budget, for this project, on the grounds that it's going to deliver these benefits in this time frame. And in that situation, very often you won't be able to work with them in an agile manner. You'll have to plan and document much, much more of what you're doing. Sometimes, perhaps you'll be developing software, say, for a fighter jet. And there's an ex incredibly expensive piece of equipment there. And what's more, there is someone who is going to be sitting inside it and their life is going to depend on whether you've written your software well or whether it des destroys the plane. In that situation, they're probably not going to be terribly happy about the idea of, well, we alliterate, and if it's not quite right, we'll try again. They're going to want to know, well and truly, in advance, that this is safe, it's secure, and what it does is very, very well defined. The company that I first worked for when I graduated from my undergraduate degree sold what's called customised off-the-shelf software, COTS software. We wrote billing and customer care systems for telephone companies. The telephone companies would be writing a big check and writing a contract and wanting to know exactly what features are going to be delivered by what date. Because they want to offer their services to their customers, people making calls. And if we were late on, develop, on delivering the features, then they wouldn't be able to offer those services to their customers and they would lose a lot of money. So that part of the business, the implementation teams that were on the customer site, setting it up for them, configuring it for their business processes, they tended to use very planned and documented, defined processes. But there were other development teams within the organization as well. For instance, there was a core product development team whose job it was to build the functionality that those implementation teams were going to be customizing and deploying onto the customer sites. And so the relationship between the implementation teams and the core product development team was much more trusting, was much more of an internal relationship where the customer Im implementation teams would be able to feed back to the core development team, okay, these are the sorts of things that our customers are starting to ask for. We need to figure out a way of providing that functionality so that next year, when, when you've got it ready, we'll be able to sell those features to our customers and make, make more money by selling those features to them as well. So even within the one company, there were teams that had very, very different software development processes. So this is the bad news. This is a software engineering course, and there's not one correct software process. I can't just tell you what you do is you do this, and then you do that, and then you do that, and then if you've done those things properly, you can be sure that you will have a correct, working, successful project at the end of it. Unfortunately, software development simply isn't like that. We don't work on tame problems. Tame problems 
are the ones that we can just sit down, work out the answer to analytically, and know in advance that this is the right answer to that problem. Software development tends to be solving wicked problems. These are problems that aren't well defined. These are problems where actually working out exactly what the problem is rather than what we think it is, is part of the problem. These are problems where what we learnt on the previous project, although it seemed similar to this one, might not actually help us on this one. We could have two projects that look superficially very, very similar to each other, but the second one has some unique feature about it that means that the solution we developed for the first project is completely unsuitable for the second one. So in this course, we're going to be looking at how software is developed and all of these different aspects. And we're going to be looking at these two different levels, how teams develop software together and how software is developed to try and address the fact that we don't always know what the problem is in advance. And the processes and the way that we develop it ends up needing to be designed to fit the problem and the business situation that we find ourselves in.